we are live now. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, sir. Oh. So, good afternoon, uh, de delegates and uh, all the doctors. Uh, I should on behalf of Shield Healthcare, welcoming you all in uh, today's uh, webinar on the topic prevention and management of uh, OHSs. And uh, our uh, guest uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Avinid Vike, sir. Sir, did his MBBS, DGO, DRME, and uh, sir is associated with ARMC IVF Fertility Center, Palakka, and Trishu. So, with this short introduction, I request sir to take over the session and meanwhile, I request all the participants uh, for your active participation and please post your queries on the chat box of the Shield Connect page. So, once the talk will be over, we can have a short chat with sir on this very important topic of OHSS. So, thank you very much, sir, for your valuable time on our platform and uh, over to you, sir, for further proceedings. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, let us uh, straight away uh, go to the, uh, our topic uh, of today. That's the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, coming to the, uh, uh, we will be uh, coming to this topic. We will be discussing it under the various headings uh, of uh, epidemiology, pathophysiology, clinical presentation, assessment, treatment, or just an in pregnancy and how to prevent it. Coming to introduction, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome uh, was first described in uh, 1943, ACLS 1943 by Rydberg et al. as a loss of control over the intended therapeutic stimulation of ovaries. In 1951, the first fatal case of OHS was report, reported. So, uh, like OHS is reported in, even in uh, very early uh, years. Next, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is an important and potentially fatal complication of ovulation induction. It is generally it is self-limiting and varies from uh, mild to severe life threatening symptoms that may require hospital admission only in 1.9% uh, of all OHS cases. That is very important. Only very uh, few uh, OHS cases uh, goes, uh, goes into fatal. Next. It, uh, it is mainly associated with the multifollicular response uh, uh, to the uh, gonadotropic stimulation, but it may uh, also occur following use of uh, CC, that is glomifant citrate, and also uh, GnRH releasing hormone, and rarely in spontaneous conception cycles. But it is very rare in spontaneous cycles. Coming to uh, epidemiology. Next slide. The incidence is uh, unknown. Uh, the classification uh, scheme uh, is uh, as under mild OHSs. Uh, it affects uh, ne nearly one third of the total IVF cycles, and 20 to 33 percent of IVF cycles. And moderate OHSs uh, in uh, three to six percent, and severe OHSs uh, in only 0.1 to two percent. From the statistics, we, we can understand that uh, only uh, severe OHS is very rare, and uh, mild OHS is usually very common in, uh, in, in, the, in the present scenario, that is in IVF cycle. Uh, coming to uh, pathophysiology, next slide. Uh, here, uh, we can in this slide, we can see uh, the follicles is uh, stimulated by the exogenous HCG which uh, increase the response of VG, VGF, vascular endothelial growth factors, uh, leading to OHS response. Uh, coming to uh, symptoms, there is, uh, next slide, uh, there is uh, pathophysiology, there is increased capillary permeability, so there is uh, fluid uh, in, in the both compartments, both vascular and extravascular. In extravascular compartment, this fluid causes edema, increased ovarian volume, SITs, hydrothorax, and there is uh, increased weight, weight gain, uh, and cyst, uh, then uh, abdomen, sol solar abdomen, and dyspnea. Coming to vascular compartment symptoms, it causes uh, increased, uh, it causes hypokalemia, albumin, increased albumin, which results in thrombosis, uh, shock, and finally oliguria. Uh, here, uh, already there is in the main uh, mechanism of the capillary leakage, that is third spacing. Uh, next slide. 
next slide Uh, coming to the uh, this is a little bit uh, com uh, it appears uh, it may appear very complicated to you. Uh, we can summarize it as below next slide it is uh, what are the uh, um, pathophysiology behind all these things there is intravascular uh, dehydration that leads to hypotension this hypotension in turn causes reduced renal perfusion which can result in renal failure accumulation of fluid in the third space resulting in SITs. Uh, pleural effusion, pulmonary edema, raised uh, intra-abdominal pressure due to SITs, which lead to venous compression causing parenchymal edema, and there is intestinal edema, uh, which is responsible for symptoms of nausea and altered bowel habits, and altered uh, uh, LFT, uh, which results in uh, due to liver edema and reduced hepatic perfusion. Then this is, there is emo concentration and high levels of estrogen, which promote hypercoagulable state, which increase the risk of thromboembolism. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Then a clinical presentation. Uh, this OGS is generally self-limiting disorder and symptoms uh, typically resolve spontaneously within seven to 10 days. It can be uh, described as early or late, depending on time of onset of symptoms. And uh, then uh, coming to early OGS, uh, this is occurs within uh, 10 days of uh, HCG trigger and refers over in response to exogenous uh, due to administration of HCG injection. Uh, next slide. Then com comes the late OGSS. It, uh, it, uh, it occurs more than uh, 10 days after HCG trigger or uh, 7 days after embryo transfer. It, 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 it is due to the response to endogenous HCG from, preg uh, from pregnancy. So it, is, it has got a prolonged course and risk of severity. So uh, what you have to understand is Late OHSS is, is always dangerous. Early OHSS we can uh, avoid uh, by uh, uh, not giving clinical uh, symptoms. Next slide. Symptoms are abdominal bloating, nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, pain, weight gain, dyspnea, oliguria, or anuria based on severity. Uh, then coming to complications. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And, uh, coming to uh, complications, we got SITs, uh, pleural or pericardial effusion, a hypovolic shock, uh, and acute renal failure, thromboembolic events, and DIC. And rarely we have got ovarian torsion, rapture, and ARDS. Then coming to the clinical presentation, the signs and symptoms of OHSS. In uh, my, first, we will come to the mild OHSS. There is abdominal bloating, uh, mild abdominal pain, over in size less than 8 cm. We have the moderate OHSS, where uh, there is nausea, vomiting, uh, moderate abdominal pain, then over in size is in the range of 8 to 12 cm. Then uh, ultrasound appearance of ascites may also be there. Then coming to uh, severe uh, OHSS, that is oliguria, hypoproteinemia, ovarian size will be greater than 12 cm, clinical ascites, hemoconcentration, the hematocritics will be uh, greater than 45%. Then coming to critical, uh, very severe OHSS, that is oliguria, anuria, and uh, WC count is uh, greater than 25,000 per uh, ml. Then there is thromboembolism, tense ascites, uh, large hydrothorax. Hematocrit uh, greater than 55% and ARDS. Next slide. Then coming to differential diagnosis, there, there may be uh, ovarian torsion, hemorrhage, rupture, pelvic infection, intraabdominal hemorrhage, ectopic appendicitis, etc. Uh, next slide. Coming to clinical assessment, uh, we should. Uh, Assess the OHSS at the time of history taking itself. History uh, should be taken in, in terms of uh, timing of ovulation induction. There should be full systemic examination, explain weight and abdominal girth, lab investigations, which include uh, blood count, electrolytes, urea, LFT, protein profile. Then we have the imaging, ultrasound, scan, chest x ray. Next slide. Then uh, coming to uh, 
this hospital management of a patient referred with uh, OHS. How it differs? First is uh, focused history. History should be focused uh, based on history of the patient. Then uh, pain, uh, site, uh, onset character, radiation, associated with time, associated factors and alleviating factors, severity, weight gain or abdominal swelling, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Then come to examination. Uh, on examination, we should uh, abdominal examination. We should be uh, we should uh, check for uh, abdominal girth, uh, distension, palpable ovaries, acute abdomen. Then uh, cardio respiratory uh, include pleural and pericardial effusion, fluid input, output chart. Uh, all, all should be checked. Then coming to investigations, there is a full bl blood count should be done. Uh, mainly hemoglobin, hematocrit, uh, WBC count. Uh, you. Then urea and electrolytes, LFT, clot, uh, coagulation profile, ultrasound scan uh, for uh, pel pelvis for assessing uh, ovarian size and uh, presence of fasciitis. Then coming to chest X-ray uh, for uh, if there is any respiratory symptoms and echo or echo uh, for if there is suspect pericardial effusion. Next slide. Coming to treatment, it, the management is generally supportive until uh, there is spontaneous resolution. It may require hospitalization for only severe to critical OHS and moderate OHS with poor system symptom control. Uh, next slide. Uh, first is uh, patient education. That is the vital component. We should uh, uh, counsel the patient regarding uh, the chances of OHS if there are any risk factors. And uh, is, you should discontinue HCG for luteal support. Uh, instead, progesterone may be used. Avoid, and standard exercise should be avoided and sexual intercourse, which can cause uh, torsion. Next slide. Uh, coming to OP, OPD basis treatment. Uh, first, there should be adequate hydration. Uh, ask them to drink as many uh, drink water as much as possible. Then antibiotics like metoclopramide, cyclicine, analgesics like paracetamol and opioid analgesics. Here uh, we should be uh, you should be cautious like uh, MSH. Uh, there is a risk of renal congress that should be avoided, and monitoring of care uh, there uh, should be done every two three days. Next slide. Symptom monitoring, uh, appearance of uh, new symptoms or worsening of existing ones should be uh, taken care of. Daily weight measurement should be done. Weight should not increase by, beyond one kilogram per day, and urinary output should be measured. Uh, if any, any of the symptoms is there, there should be absent clinical review. This can be assessed by the patient itself, himself, uh, herself, sorry, patient herself. Um, next slide. Um, when uh, the patient require hospitalization, it is required for uh, severe cases, poor symptom control, and for social considerations. It should be a multidisciplinary care. And ICU care if needed, analgesic, fluid management, thromboprophylaxis, and treatment of complications. And coming to uh, treatment of uh, uh, treatment, hospitalized treatment, uh, the fluid management is like oral fluid should uh, should be preferred or IV fluids. It is like uh, two to three liter of uh, of fluids with strict fluid uh, electrolyte balance. Urine output should be um, greater than 20 to 30 ml per hour. Which should not go, go to uh, urea, urea. Avoid uh, worsening state space fluid shift. Production of hypovolemia, hypotension, and hemoconcentration. Then uh, crystallates. Uh, everyone will be uh, doubtful whether they can use crystallates. Crystallates can be used uh, like uh, physiological saline, or it is normal saline, or that's close in normal saline. But ringer lactate uh, should be avoided, as there will be a hyponatremia usually. And colloids like albumin, mannitol, dextran, hydroxyl may be required for plasma expansion. Of this, mm. HES is uh, more useful. Next slide. Uh, coming to diuretics, it should be uh, as far as avoided due to it may cause uh, depletion of intravascular volume. But it has a role in case of persistent oliguria, despite, despite uh, adequate uh, uh, intravascular volume expansion and normal intravascular pressure after the paralysis. Next slide. Uh, 
Next slide. Uh, when a uh, patient should be uh, under, undergo uh, should undergo paracentesis, you speak of paracentesis. When ascites is causing pain, compromised pulmonary function, or a liguria anuria, unresponsive to appropriate fluid management, you should uh, take the patient for paracentesis. It uh, what it does. It causes reduced intraoral pressure and there is increased renal perfusion. Uh, next slide. Then uh, uh, thromboprophylaxis with uh, TED stocking, that is uh, thromboembolic uh, deterrent stocking, low molecular heparin, sub, ideally subcutaneous enoxaparin 40 mg daily, and heparin uh, 5000 uh, international units worth only can be used. Treatment of thromboembolism should be done with low molecular weight heparin. Next slide. Then chest tube drainage, if there is significant pleural effusion, that, uh, that we, uh, and Surgical intervention should be done if there is uh, ovarian torsion. Then uh, symptoms should be monitored uh, every day. And, uh, the abdominal girth should be measured. Vital oxygen should be checked every uh, two to eight hourly. Daily physical intake of food monitoring. And then uh, next, uh, serial uh, food blood count, uh, electrolytes, urea, creatine should be done uh, checked the, the daily. LFT clotting profile uh, when required, ultrasound, echo, uh, chest X-ray should be done as required. Then coming to uh, inpatient monitoring with OHSS. Uh, in history, we should uh, check for uh, pain, uh, breathlessness, hydration, weight, and cardiovascular symptoms like heart rate, BP, abdominal girth, distension, SITs, intake output chart, all should be uh, checked in examination. Investigations should include uh, food blood count, hemoglobin, hematocrit, WBC count, urea electrolytes, LFT, uh, then baseline uh, clotting studies, pelvic ultrasound for ovarian size, chest X ray for uh, or ultrasound if there is suspected, ECG and echo if there is subject suspected, pericardial effusion. Uh, next slide. Then coming to the most important part OHS and pregnancy. Severe OHSS is commonly associated with the pregnancy. Pregnancy may continue uh, normally with, uh, even though the patient has OHSS, but there is no evidence of increased risk of congenital abnormalities in OHSS. Then coming to prevention, it begins with the identification of patients. All patients uh, who are at risk of uh, OHSS should be uh, taken care of the, in, at the initial visit itself by proper history taking and uh, examination. There, if there is a history, you should ask it whether there is a prior history of OHSS, whether what's the age of the patient, what's the weight of the patient, weight, uh, what's the BMI, whether she's having PCOS, whether uh, she in the earlier treatment, whether she was taken, had she had taken a GNRH agonist injection, or should be uh, asked. Then uh, in, in UST, if there is increased AFC, that is greater than 24, or in the in serum AMH, AMH level, greater than 3.36, anti-mullerian uh, hormone level, then the, if there are multiple follicles in UST, that is greater than 14 follicles, uh, uh, that is, that is uh, more than 14 follicles with diameter of 11 mm. Then a rapidly rising E2, that is serum studio level, uh, should always uh, should be alert. Then the prevention of OHS. It can be two, two, two types, primary or secondary. Primary prevention, you should reduce the dose of gonadotropins as far as possible. Then chronic low-dose step-up protocol could, should be used in treatment. Then there should be limited ovarian uh, stimulation. Avoid FSH on day of uh, HCG. Response should be monitored with the serial ultrasound scan and serum estradiol level uh, whenever possible. And a cutoff value of U2 is 2500, 5 kilograms per ml. You should always, if the U2 is process 2500, you should always be alert. Then uh, reduced duration of exposure to gonadotropin, uh, like a mild, using mild stimulation protocol, using clomiphene and uh, GNRH antagonist uh, can watch uh, Use of GNHR antagonist protocol uh, in uh, against agonist protocol. Uh, is bad, uh, is good for uh, for uh, preventing autism.
then uh, no use of uh, hcg uh, for luteal support always use progesterone then uh, in vitro maturation of oocytes uh, especially in the case of pcos and all you do mature ivm of uh, oocytes and later do uh, frozen transfer then use of insulin sensitive agents like uh, metformin pioglitazone etc in patient with pcos so it has got a metformin has got a dual benefit first it uh, re reduces the insulin resistance and uh, oocytes also in the late phase then uh, costing even though uh, costing uh, we used to do uh, to avoid uh, weakened uh, ivf it can also be uh, done uh, done as a treatment for uh, oocytes you should withhold the uh, further gonadotropin stimulation for uh, two to three days for uh, two to three days and uh, delay hcg administration until estradiol level plateau or decrease significantly there is no reduction uh, but uh, it is seen that there is no reduction in uh, moderate or severe oocytes in uh, rct um but uh, it, um, you should delay at least for 3 days next slide please a cycle cancellation It can lead to uh, wastage of resources uh, risk of uh, spontaneous ovulation and there will be severe mental trauma uh, to patient so uh, cycle cancellation as far as possible and uh, reduced hcg dose as ovulation dose like that is uh, uh, 5000 instead of uh, 10000 uh, can be used then uh, next plan alternative triggers it include gnrh agonist in anaerobic stimulated cycles uh, example uh, luprolite uh, triptorelin etc or recombinant lh uh, it can also be used but uh, pregnancy rate will be little lower and there is poor cost benefit ratio but as far as possible hc uh, is better but uh, to prevent there is life threatening um, oocytes we should always resort to so to uh, gnrh agonist or recombinant lh as trigger then uh, cryo preservation of oocytes it can prevent late uh, late oocytes and exacerbation of early oocytes by pregnancy here you do uh, cryo preservation of oocytes uh, and do uh, frozen embryo transfer especially in case of pcos and all and you can prevent oocytes then dopamine agonist like cavergolin there uh, reverse the path of physiology of oocytes that is they reverse vascular endothelial growth factor mediated vascular permeability they can be started on uh, day of hcg trigger uh, as a uh, usual dose is uh, 0.5 ml once daily for 8 days so uh, uh, what the thing uh, which is better about dopamine is that uh, they can be used uh, even on the 8th uh, day uh, on the on the day of uh, hcg trigger that, you know, that means around 12th or 13th day of uh, uh, Towards the day of stimulation, but uh, metformin you have to start in the early. Okay, next slide. Then coming to IV, IV uh, this uh, colloids, uh, IV albumin hydroxyethyl starch. Uh, they bind vasodilatory agents and increase plasma over the pressure. Here, uh, IV albumin is a little expensive, but you, you can uh, usually we usually usually uh, use uh, uh, IV hydroxy uh, this thing hydroxyethyl starch. Or, or volume and stuff. Then, the uh, another change is the salvage. It can cause reduction or plateau of uh, rising estrogen levels in the mid cycle. Then, uh, next slide, please. Uh, then, uh, in short, uh, to summarize, prevention of OHS is during IVF. Uh, before uh, IVF, uh, we have to there is the identification of risk factors to individualize uh, control over the stimulation. then uh, correct adaptation of stimulation protocols monitoring of control over stimulation using ultrasound etc uh, which is considered the gold standard use of uh, gnrh antagonist cycle cancellation or costing if needed then uh, at the time of uh, ohss then limit the dose of uh, or uh, concentration of hcg uh, use uh, recombinant lh or gnrh agonist to, to trigger ovulation in vitro maturation prophylactic albumin or hydroxyethyl starch in high risk patient transfer of single embryo uh, and preventing uh, oocytes then after uh, uh, pick up you can do cryoprocession of whole embryos for transfer subsequent cycle using progesterone instead of hcg for uh, luteal phase support this is the same attainment when you do fresh transfer 
dopamine agonist like uh, capgoli use of antagonist uh, that is antagonist sertraline etc uh, for a few days um, of embryo transfer next slide this slide is little uh, appears to be less so stupid but uh, what you can see is uh, what are all the recommended uh, uh, protocol one is uh, for ohs that just i will go through recommended protocols only one is reducing gonadotropin dose that is uh, is recommended for uh, ohs then uh, gnrh uh, ag agonist uh, as an ovulation trigger is recommended then adjuvant met metformin therapy is recommended capergolin on uh, day of hg is recommended Uh, that co um, costing and all uh, is not uh, further studies has to be uh, done. Actually recommend. So uh, to this slide please. So uh, to conclude, ovarian hyperstimulation is mostly iatrogenic and self-limiting disorder. Only you have to uh, monitor the patient uh, continuously. There is a Good uh, clinical acumen is required to diagnose. Like, oh, you should not miss uh, oliguria, abdominal dysplasia, etc. There are multiple options of preventable prevention available to reduce incidence and limit severity. At the uh, initial uh, medical management level, you can use uh, metformin, uh, capgolin, etc. And uh, do the day of trigger, you can uh, uh, change the trigger from HCG to oh, this GNR uh, uh, agonist agonist trigger. And uh, if we are doing IVF, you can uh, always uh, uh, frozen transfer instead of fresh transfer. Thank you. Thank you for your. Uh, Thank you. Time. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for this uh, elaborative. Uh, you know, details. sir, just give me one minute time to check uh, if any questions are there in the chat. Also. Okay. 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 Sure. So, uh, if you allow me, then uh, we can take the questions. Okay, okay. So, sir, one question is: uh, How can you reduce uh, the risk of uh, this OHSs? So, um, as we already discussed, uh, OHSs uh, prevention can be can should start uh, strategies from the uh, initial uh, initially from the history taking itself. Uh, whether uh, when, when the patient comes, you have to ask her uh, about uh, previous history of uh, fertility treatment. Whether uh, uh, th that time she had uh, OHSs, on and and and, uh, and other things like her uh, BMI, uh, history of PCOS, etc. Then uh, next level is uh, once you start seeing it, and then uh, you should uh, see this, uh, this uh, do a basal scan scan for a patient to check the AFC. And whether uh, and to uh, diagnose whether she have a, a PCOS, that time you have to reduce the dose of this thing, uh, gonadotropins. And uh, once you start simulation, if you even though you are uh, reduced, the, you are alert uh, initially, and still uh, patient uh, lands in into OHSs, then uh, then uh, what you have you can do is modify the trigger. Instead of HCG, you can give either GNR agonist trigger or LH trigger. Uh, then, uh, if you are in, in the midway of an IVF cycle, instead of uh, you, uh, if you are uh, well in fresh transfer, uh, then also you can change it to as uh, frozen transfer. Mm, and uh, these are all the uh, major strategies to prevent OHSs. It's a, a trial and error. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much, sir. And uh, another question is, sir. Uh, what about this uh, luprolide and uh, cabergolin? Uh, so cabergolin uh, basically means uh, use at which situation? Uh, cab uh, usually uh, we use uh, the medical management of OHSN. Uh, once uh, the good thing about uh, cabergolin is that uh, you can start even at the day it is it is usually started. At the day of HCG trigger, so around day 11, day 12, and all. So you can start little bit uh, late. Uh, once uh, you are doing serial ultrasound uh, monitoring for OHSS.
sir you uh, sir uh, please unmute yourself sir if you know there is hyper stimulation uh, then you can start around uh, day 11 or day 12 uh, it uh, decreases the uh, response of uh, vegf vascular endothelial growth factor and uh, you should dose is 0.5 mg daily for some uh, one week and all so uh, at, at, uh, after starting the stimulation this abdolin comes in the picture unless unlike a metformin which you should start at the early to get a delay, uh, decrease or just Thank you very much, sir. And just last, uh, last question, sir. During these IVF procedures, as per your opinion, any general things need to take care of to prevent these chances of age, OHSS? General thing, uh, general thing we, we should we should do uh, before uh, this thing, uh, to prevent OHSS is uh, a uh, weight loss. Because uh, weight loss can... Uh, uh, the decrease in insulin resistance uh, and um, the dose of gonadotropin uh, uh, can be reduced. This uh, this is the single factor which determines uh, OHSS, that is the dose of gonadotropin. So if the uh, patient uh, undergoes uh, like uh, some weight weight uh, losing protocols like heavy uh, exercise, diet diet modification, etc., uh, her uh, weight can be reduced, and it, it, this in turn causes uh, decrease insulin resistance. And it again uh, helps in uh, reduce dose uh, dose of gonadotropin, uh, which was um, uh, re reduced dose of gonadotropin, uh, which can uh, prevent OHSS. And also the dose of if you are uh, not doing IVF, if you are uh, doing the normal uh, mild stimulation also, the dose of omifine can also be reduced by uh, weight loss. Thank you. So thank you very much, sir, uh, for this uh, elaborate um, description of this very important topic uh, that is OHSS, uh, which is uh, very much uh, uh, means, uh, noticeable in case of this uh, IVF uh, procedure. So thank you very much, sir, for your valuable time on our platform to discuss such an interesting topic. And in future also, we will look forward for some valuable session with you. So thank you very much, sir. Have a good Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Suman and Shil. Uh, and she'll connect uh, to uh, for giving me a chance for this uh, wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir.